tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend. Tonight's a very special night on Drew Blood's Dark Tales. It's International Women's Day, the day we celebrate all sorts of international women. I tell you, I do enjoy a fine import. Don't you, Chester? <laughs> Me too, pal. And to make things better, we've got a very special story for you. Come on in. It's borderline warm out here. Yeah, I'll tell you. Here in Texas, we had a pretty brisk winter this year. It was a Tuesday, as I recall it. Anyway, let's go. Hmm. Well, that's better. So tonight, we begin a two-parter, courtesy of our pal P.D. Williams. As you'd expect from always stoic and serious P.D. Williams, there are absolutely no jokes or flippant matter in this story. And you can prepare yourself for two weeks of serious horror. But before we get to that, consider visiting simplyscarypodcast.com and signing up as a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can get the entire catalog dating back to 2012, ad-free and available to download or stream. Just click the Patrons Area tab and have at it. So, this one's the fourth installment of the lauded Craig and Lorna series. Well, it went a little long, I understand. And while I'm not always up on those fancy industry terms, I take that means we're in for quite the adventure. So without further delay, I give you from author P.D. Williams, Part 1 of Craig's Sea Terror. Prologue The full moon hovered high above the horizon, producing a shimmering cone of pale light on the surface of the water. A lone white flashlight beam led Thomas along the dark shoreline at Tybee Beach. The high-pitched pings of his metal detector, coupled with the low roar of the waves striking the land, were the only sounds. Thomas looked like your quintessential beachcomber. Sixty-ish, bucket hat, loose shorts, sandals with high black socks, and the absolute must-have metal detector. He preferred beachcombing at night. The rowdy teenagers had left for nearby motels that tolerated underage reveling. The adult beachgoers who had stolen a few hours of silent sanity had returned to their families. Working around tourists was not a major issue. Savvy vacationers knew the best beaches and resorts were across the Talmaj Memorial Bridge in Hilton Head. Besides its murky brown water and by-the-hour motels, Tybee Beach, also known as Waimee Beach by the locals, was the go-to for renting a beach house if you didn't mind bugs and didn't care about luxury. Thomas had been walking the empty beach for an hour when he noticed something shiny and amorphous ahead of him along the shoreline. He approached what turned out to be a 6x10 blanket of red seaweed. When he swung the flashlight's ray over it, the slick strands swiftly snapped together forming a gelatinous mass about the size of a basketball. What kind of crap has the Union Carbide plant flushed in the water now? Thomas wondered. He set the metal detector down and searched for an object to prod the strange glob of seaweeds with. Fortunately for Thomas, cleanliness wasn't a major concern on this small strip of coastline. He spotted some empty beer cans a short distance away. Thomas walked over, picked one up, then returned to his discovery, kneeling beside it. He easily pushed the can into the mass, which had a gelatin-like softness. You're too soft to be a jellyfish. After a brief half-hearted inspection, Thomas lost interest. Ah, oh, who gives a crap anyway? I got some pocket change to discover. Yes, sirree. Coins lead to dollars. And dollars lead to 7-Eleven for some PBRs and Philly's blunts. 
Thomas stood and walked back toward his metal detector. Pop! The soft poof of air was loud enough to catch his attention. Turning around, he spotted the beer can at his feet. He redirected the flashlight's beam to the ball of gunk. It appeared to be pulsing. Oh, no you ain't, he muttered nervously. He laid the metal detector down again and picked up the can. It felt sticky and smelled like rotten fish. Thomas returned to the quivering lump and bent over. He pushed the can into its center and stepped back a couple of feet. He gasped when the thing expelled the can again. Well now, that's odd. Thomas approached the mass and leaned in for a closer look. I might ought to contact the EPA about... A squishy red strand sprang from the object and latched onto Thomas's chest, producing a yelp. As he tugged at the sticky tendril, four more strands shot out and attached themselves to his shoulders, neck, and head. His skin burned as though fire had touched it. His eyes watered from the stench. Thomas wailed as the shifting gob shot a dozen more strings, each one snaking over his torso and burrowing under his skin. The acidic vines burned through his muscles and bones like scorching hot drills. His mind panicked and his heartbeat quickened as the adrenaline produced by his terror rushed through his nervous system, making the pain more acute. His pleas for help were loud and shrill, but proved useless on the empty beach this late at night. The creature continued unleashing a barrage of thick strands towards Thomas's face, invading his nose, eyes, and mouth, muffling his screams. Thomas continued prying at the invasive ropes, the strands wrapped around his hands and arms growing thinner and wider like melting rubber. Some of the other tendrils tightened, serving as grappling hooks for the oily ore below. With lightning speed, it sprang upward, spreading midair like a slimy towel blanket in Thomas's upper torso. Desperate to remove the suffocating goo, Thomas rushed into the water and thrashed around, trying to wash it off his stinging skin. But the thing expanded as if Thomas's pain was feeding it. Once it had engulfed Thomas, his struggle ceased. With its hunger satiated, the man-sized mass sank under the surf and made its way down the silent beach. Chapter 1 Craig Wankamoff was a stupid man with too much free time on his hands. The weak economy had pushed him to abandon the scrap metal recycling business and look for another source of income. Seeking inspiration, he combed through a handful of online job sites. However, telemarketing, taxidermy, and Chippendale Dancer didn't feel like a good fit for him. After a while, he grew tired of job hunting and did some web surfing for something interesting to watch. He had finished guffawing at a YouTube video of a Filipino teen burping to the tune of Houdini by Dua Lipa when he stumbled across an entertaining video. It presented the sport of parkour, an activity involving quickly moving through an area typically in an urban environment, negotiating obstacles by running, jumping, and climbing. Ever the vocational pioneer, Craig began imagining commercial possibilities. I'll bet I can figure this thing out and teach it to folks. How hard can it be? It's all about bouncing off of stuff. He pondered prospective clients. Who can I market this to? Can't be young, active folks. They'll have me figured out right off the bat. It needs to be someone who don't know too much about it. Soon, the answer hit him in the face like a two-by-four. Old folks, he thought. They don't know nothing about this sport. I'll look like an expert. Craig used Google to find rest homes close to the trailer park and saw that the nearest one was in Claxton, where he lived. The next closest was nearly 50 miles away in Stillwell. He had severely limited options, to put it mildly. If he failed to make the sell in his own backyard, the whole venture would be a one and done. Craig turned the knob up on his thinking cap. Let's see. I'll need a good sales pitch, my Sunday go-to-meeting suit, and a winning smile. 
He went online and downloaded information on parkour. After Lorna headed to work, he would study the material and learn a few key maneuvers. Craig's plan was to practice them on his own, but he couldn't dedicate much time to perfecting them. His financial situation worsened by the day. Also, some of them looked scary and dangerous. At 32, he had plenty of life left to enjoy. But the old folks, that was a different matter. They were closer to high-fiving Jesus than he was, so he'd let them be the risk-takers. He focused on his sales pitch instead. After a couple of weeks, he was locked, cocked, and ready to rock for his new career as a parkour instructor for the elderly. If he only knew. Chapter 2 Craig arrived early for the meeting that he had set up with the director of Knocking on Heaven's Door Retirement Home, a short, pudgy hobbit of a man named Blythe Uptick. After listening to Craig's spiel about the profitability of parkour training, Uptick agreed to pay him a fee of $25 per hour for weekly instruction. Hands were shaken, a contract was signed, then Craig was off to the races with his latest business venture. Within a few weeks, Craig had formed a group of a dozen residents to take part in the new activity. All went well, for a while. It was during the third class when things unraveled. Craig collected everyone in the center's rec room. Okie doke, we are gonna start with the simple tuck and roll. Betty, why don't you start us off? Just do it like I showed you. But Craig, I'm scared, said the frail old woman. I'm not as limber as I used to be. Yeah, right. <laughs> One of the male residents snickered as other men grinned in agreement. One of them chimed in. Don't worry, Craig. She's limber enough. Talk about your ooh-la-la. -la. <laughs> that minx don't give head. She gives mine. <laughs> Craig ignored the crass remarks and encouraged Betty. Come on now, you got this, Betty. Just bend over, tuck your head twixt your knees, and roll forward. Well, Betty said tentatively. I, I reckon it won't hurt to try. At a girl, Craig beamed. With great care, Betty set aside her walker, took a deep breath, and bent over. Oh, yeah! said the woman next to her, waving away the gassy mist emanating from Betty's backside. That's very unbecoming. The gentleman behind Betty had a different perspective. Sweet mercy, he yelled, coughing and wheezing as he too fanned away the funky fumes. Uh, I can smell the cabbage she had for lunch. He sniffed and gagged. <laughs> I believe there might be some onions in cahoots as well. The resident next to him gave a warning. Alan, if you're going to pew, let me know right now. If I get a whiff of your chunky style gourd, I'm going to barf up bacon for sure. Craig took back control of the room. Uh, Betty, just sit back down, darling. We'll try the tuck part of the move another time. Tuck is the right time, said an anonymous voice from the back row. I might want to have her tuck a dry sheet up her butt. Gales of laughter filled the rec hall. Craig made another attempt to regain everyone's attention. That's enough, y'all. Leave poor Betty alone so we can move on. Now, before we get going, I want to address the elephant in the room. I admit, we got off to kind of a rough start during last week's class. But y'all gotta believe me. If I'd known Elmer had a bad hip, I would have never pushed him off that roof. The way he twirled through the air, I really thought he was gonna stick the landing. Little Tony the janitor say he heard the snap all the way in the men's toilets over in the east wing, shared a resident. Elmer got off easy, said a woman. One that didn't have a chance of leaping over that golf cart Craig drove at her. I hear the curse splat every time I snooze, which is often. 
Now, just hold on there, Craig said defensively. I chose Wanda because she seemed to have a spring in her step. Craig's response failed to satisfy the woman. Too bad she didn't have a spring in her skull. It might have softened the landing. Now she thinks she's Gordon Ramsay. If she calls me a stupid donkey for ruining the risotto again, I'm gonna belt her one. Just as Craig was about to neutralize the attack, he noticed an attendant waving at him. Y'all talk amongst yourselves for a bit. I gotta go see about something. Craig joined the attendant named Maxwell. Sup, Mr. Max? Maxwell frowned. How many times have I told you not to call me that? Hard to say. I ain't never been good at math. If I had a nickel for every time I flunked a math problem, I'd have... Well, it'd be a lot. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Director wants to see you. What about? He'll explain everything to you when you get there. Now, come on. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. Maxwell turned and led Craig to Uptick's office while some of the horny male residents hit on Betty. Chapter 3 Maxwell knocked on the door to Uptick's office and waited for permission to enter. From inside, a voice called out, Enter if you must. Leave if you don't. Maxwell opened the office door and waved Craig inside. Craig entered, then Maxwell closed the door and went about his business. Come on in, Craig, and have a seat, Uptick said. Craig shuffled nervously to a chair in front of Uptick's small wooden desk and sat down. Uptick gazed at Craig for several uncomfortable seconds, as though he was wondering where to begin. Craig, I'll tell you why I summoned you. We've been getting complaints about you from some residents and their families. What kind of complaints? Uh, Would you like me to start alphabetically or chronologically? Uptick opened a file folder on his desk and removed a few sheets of official-looking papers. Glaring at Craig, he asked, Did you really instruct a 74-year-old woman to scale the outside of a building? Let me explain, Chief. Uh, I had just talked her through a parkour move that allows you to bounce twixt two buildings like Jackie Chan until you reach the roof. I can't help it if that brittle old bag couldn't follow directions. Besides, it wasn't as bad as you're making out. Mrs. Lomax fell three stories. I admit that's a bit. Before hitting the canopy in front of the building. Let me explain. Where she bounced off and flew several feet through the air, clearing the wall. I know it looks. And landed on top of a passing 18 wheeler headed for the interstate. I'm sure it'll work out. Work out? Uptick asked, incredulous. I fielded a call this morning from the Texas Border Patrol saying they found her clinging to the roof of a truck full of crack that was headed for Mexico. Look, I've heard and had enough, Craig. I'm letting you go. Letting me go where? I gotta get home early enough to stop El Superbo from sodomizing the sofa. No, Craig, no. That's not what I mean. That's not what I mean at all. What I'm trying to tell you is you're fired. Craig was flabbergasted, mortified. Why? With a few hiccups hither and yon, the class has been going okay. Okay? Craig, you talked an 80-year-old man into climbing a pine tree like a spider monkey. We don't have a long enough ladder to reach him, and he's scared to come down. Hell, he's still up there. We throw apples to him so he doesn't starve. Worst yet, we suspect he's been drinking his own urine. Do I really have to go into some of your other stupid mishaps? Look, Craig said, I know you're upset, but there ain't no reason to bring my marriage into this. Uptick shook his head in frustration. Craig, please, just go. Can't you give me one more chance? Craig, let me be crystal clear. There is zero chance in our known galaxy, and beyond that, I'd ever allow you to stay on at our center. You are an abysmal failure and our worst mistake. May the holy triune God rip my soul from me and cast it into the hottest furnace in hell if I even consider bringing you back. So I'm here and I may have some wiggle room here. 
Uptick picked up its phone's receiver and pressed the button on its console. Security? Alarm filled Craig as he heard the words. All right, all right, I'm going. You don't gotta be so mean about it. Craig got up, went to the door, then paused. He turned to Uptick and sneered. And to think I was considering letting you get lucky. Craig made a proud exit as Uptick dropped puke bombs into his waste paper basket. Chapter 4 It was late morning at the Snappy Snip. Despite the early hour, the hair salon was hopping, courtesy of the $2 haircut special that the owner was offering. Lorna had finished with her last customer with no others waiting, so she was keeping busy by sweeping the floor. The only thing she detested more than the beginning of sweeping were the final moments. There was always that thin line of grime that was impossible to get up. She'd wondered many times if she ought to roll a dollar bill into a tube and snort it like coke. She was still sweeping when the door sensor dinged. A tall, stout man with a red bushy beard and nose ring entered. He was dressed in torn jeans and a faded t-shirt that featured the state's motto, Georgia, it's a state. The salon's greeter, a thin, stringy-haired, bug-eyed gal named Jade, welcomed him. Hey there. I take it you're here to get a haircut? Oh, uh, yeah, the man answered. And I'd like y'all to cut the other ones as well. I think that's how it usually works, said Jade. Ringing up the cell, she asked the man if he'd like to make a charitable contribution. Would you care to donate a few dollars towards Anal Rape Awareness Month? The proceeds go to providing smokes to the young fellas entering the penal system for the first time. It gives them something to offer in exchange for keeping their boon keys safe. They don't call the lifers hardened criminals for nothing. Gee, I don't know, the man said, stroking his beard. I don't think it's that big a deal. One man's pucker pounding is another man's drunken family reunion. With the matter settled, the man paid for the haircut. And may I have a name, please? Uh, I'd prefer to remain anonymous. You can go by one name, like Lizzo, Rihanna, or Drake. I'm sick of you. Technically, that's three names, but okay. After checking in the man, Jade smiled and said, Right this way, sick of you. I'll let Ramon know that you're here. Guilt overtook her as she led the unsuspecting man to Ramon's styling station, the scene of many unsettling episodes involving unfortunate haircuts. The male stylist's incompetence was matched only by the severity of his delusion that he was anything but. Ramon's single legitimate claim to fame was when he had worked as a studio tech on the iconic 80s hit Take On Me by the pop trio Aha. His job had been to twist the vice grips on the lead singer's testicles for the high notes at the end of each chorus. Soon Jade and the victim arrived at the spot where Nice Hair went to die. Here we are, sick of you. Seating him, she was relieved he didn't notice the droplets of blood on the floor. Ramon will be along shortly, she said, before walking to the break room at the rear of the salon to alert Ramon he had another innocent waiting. After a few minutes, Ramon made his grand entrance. His appearance never ceased to amuse. He was a flabby, crepe-skinned 60-year-old who looked as if he had ticked off father time. His purple mohawk, coupled with an undersized clash t-shirt, tucked into tight leather breeches, gave him the appearance of a washed-out 80s punk rocker. As he hacked away at the hair of unwitting clients, he often shared unsolicited biographical information. For example, he told them he was living on a diet of Fruit Loops, that he used to cut hair for the techno pop band Flock of Seagulls, and that he shared a one-room efficiency apartment with a cat named Mrs. Rosencrantz. Witnessing Ramon cut hair made his concerned co-workers tense. It was like watching a scene from a Hitchcock film featuring a young couple chatting away in a French cafe, unaware of the ticking time bomb attached to the underside of their table. Ramon introduced himself. Hello, my muse. My name is Ramon. <laughs> I shall make you appear as a god. 
How's about you make me appear at work on time, said the man. Let's go, Sid Vicious. Chop, chop. As Ramon went about his business, he droned on with his in-depth and uninteresting self-revelations as if he were being interviewed on The Tonight Show. He was also working to contain a suspicious cough he had had all morning, <laughs> one that was about to launch into orbit a rocket of horrific consequences. Ramon was yakking up exact change, all the while chattering away about everything from the Middle Ages to the methods he used to sublimate his sexual attraction to Whoopi Goldberg. Without warning, he let go of violent hack, <coughs> causing him to utter the word that no one wants to hear their surgeon, dentist, or barber say. Oops. Ramon's customer sat wide-eyed and defenseless as the slip of the buzzer relieved him of his hair's natural part, along with his left eyebrow and the side of his beard. The poor man didn't recognize the gapped-up subhuman rodeo clown that was leering back at him from the mirror. Lorna imagined what tortured thoughts were roaring through the disfigured man's mind. Where are my sideburns? Where is my dignity? Will anyone ever love me again? What have you done to me, you dick-diddling dumbass? Relax, my celestial brother. This minor mishap has created a look that is very... I'm gonna kill you, Billy Idol! The man sprang from the chair and put Ramon in a headlock. Help! Someone, please come to my aid! Upon seeing the unscheduled grudge match, Jade beat her chest and grunted like an angry ape. Screeching, she charged the man on all fours, leaping onto his back and gnawing on his ear like it was a banana. Ah! You let me go, you little wall-eyed mopstick! The man howled. Ramon used the opportunity to grab a jar of blue comb sanitizer from his counter and ah! flung the contents in the man's face. Take a lot. Ah! The man hollered. Mm, I can't see! I can't see! The other customers screamed in terror and huddled together along a back wall. You think the big fella would kill the little punker guy? A customer asked the stylist crouched beside them. Please, sir, she replied. Don't get our hopes up. It'd be a mighty big letdown if he doesn't. Ramon's angry customer spun around several times, eventually slinging Jade off his back. Her flailing body flew directly at the people hunkered twelve feet away. Incoming! cried an old woman. The small group scattered just before Jade's airborne body slammed into the wall behind them with a resounding thud, leaving a jade-shaped dent in the sheetrock. Ramon's face became dark blue as his body began going limp. Before losing consciousness, he managed to move words through his constricted throat. <laughs> Please, my good sir, think of the magical words of John Lennon. <laughs> Give peace a chance. The man was ready with his own musical trivia. In the words of Little Richard, let's twist and shout. I'll twist and you shout. No, no, he grabbed no, Ramon's ankles and swung him around several times. No. Here's a golden oldie for you from the Steve Miller band. Fly like an eagle! Oh my God. The loud let go of Ramon's ankle, sending him whirling through the air like a frisbee. Ramon's high-pitched wail sounded like a firework spinner as he whizzed toward the front of the store just as a short, fat woman was waddling in. The air whooshed from her body as Ramon slammed into her, knocking her on her back. Although amused, Lorna recognized the need to intervene. She positioned her hands in front of her submissively and gradually moved toward the growling man. How's about I give you a refund, sir? She offered. A refund? How's about you buy me a dang house? He said. My head looks like a bad patch of Texas road. This place sucks. I ain't never coming back here. The rowdy redneck ripped off his smock, threw it on the floor and stormed out of the salon. Stepping over Ramon and the struggling woman, and giving everyone the naughty half of a peace sign. Someone look after Jade, and I'll take care of the other two, Lorna said, rushing outside. After helping Ramon stand up, Lorna proceeded to calm the woman who had been pinned beneath them. <sighs> I guess some people don't appreciate art, sniffed Ramon. Lorna shook her head. 
Ramon, darling, that's like saying people don't appreciate how much weight they've lost after an amputation. The flattened female regained her wits and rose to her feet. Her body swayed and flopped, making her look like an inflatable tube man. Lorna put her arm around the woman's shoulders. I'm so sorry about all this, ma'am. Is there anything I can do for you? Well, since you're asking, the woman said. How's about getting me that hunk's phone number? I like them rough, tough, and eager to stuff. On that note, Lorna re-entered the salon, stepping over the broken glass, scattered combs, and styling tools, and made her way to the small break room in the back. She plopped onto a cheap plastic chair, buried her face in her hands, and weighed her options. Multiple homicides, head out early. Multiple homicides, head out early. Lorna didn't know which side her mental coin was going to land on. If it fell on the wrong side, she'd be like a chimp with a handgun walking through a crowded mall. She wasn't sure about the details, but she knew it would make the six o'clock news. Chapter 5 The underground chamber grew silent as the leader, Dr. Byron B. Badcookie, entered and took his place at the head of the long table. An anonymous entity had chosen the renowned and infamous scientist to spearhead a project whose goal was to create and perfect a new type of biological weaponry. This position of power and responsibility weren't new to Bad Cookie. Several clandestine enterprises had tasked him many times over the years with discovering various means of human annihilation. But this experiment challenged him in a way that he hadn't been before over the course of his illustrious career. Bad Cookie was a gaunt man who was small yet imposing. He was middle-aged, but with his purple eye bags and thin and white hair pulled back tightly in a bun, he looked much older. He was a somber and scholarly man with perfect dictation and enunciation. His eyes were frozen plates that exuded no empathy, only sociopathic sadism. When he entered a room, the air felt thicker, colder. Chatter stopped, eyes cast downward. The only sound aloud was his voice, a chilling, lifeless monotone that had the effect of verbal thumbscrews. The collection of diabolical geniuses assembled before him wordlessly acknowledged his superior intellect. It was time for them to listen. Please be seated, Bad Cookie said. He waited for the cacophony of mumbling and scooting chairs to die down before beginning his presentation. I'd like to welcome you all to our underground facility. I've handpicked each of you to take part in one of the most consequential undertakings in the annals of scientific warfare. For those of you who do not know me, I am Dr. Byron B. Bad Cookie. I hold a PhD in biology, microphysics, nanotechnology, and small engine repair. I have worked with several reputable scientific organizations, as well as nefarious dictatorships like Russia, China, North Korea, and homeowners association. Poor guy, whispered one scientist to another. I have a brother-in-law who can't keep a job either. Silence, yelled Bad Cookie. Mine should be the only voice heard in this room. After a few nervous coughs, the quiet returned. That's better, Bad Cookie said, resuming his speech. I invited each of you because of your elite skills as experts in your respective fields. Dr. Blithering, the world respects your pioneering work in cellular engineering. And you, Dr. Proctor, are the leading expert on toxicology for which you earned the Nobel Prize for fields people care little about. And, of course, Jamie Lee Curtis, an acclaimed actress who... Wait, why is Jamie Lee Curtis here? I am sorry, Miss Curtis, but this meeting is by invitation only. 
You'll have to leave. Embarrassed by the exclusion, the actress rose and left the hall. The others waited in complete silence, listening to Jamie Lee making her way down a long corridor. The sound of a heavy door being pushed open, then slamming shut, echoed in the distance. Now that Jamie Lee Curtis has left, I shall continue, Bad Cookie said. The last individual whom I wish to introduce is our executive janitor, Cleavon Jackson. Cleavon brings his locally renowned skills in commercial cleaning to our project. Cleavon, a gnarled black elderly man with a gold front tooth and a milky eye, raised his bony hand. The committee recognizes Cleavon, Bad Cookie said. How could you not recognize him? muttered the scientist. He's the only person here in pit-stained coveralls that smells like ripple and toilet bowl cleaner. Thank you, Doc, Cleavon said in a gruffy voice. I'd like to ask all y'all gymnasts to refrain from flicking your cigarette butts up in the urinal. It makes them soggy and hard to light. Yay. Thank you, Cleavon, Bad Cookie said. Our group will extend you every professional courtesy. As for the rest of our esteemed participants, I'd like to give you each a proper introduction, but your names are unpronounceable, and most of us don't care who you are anyway. Moving on, I want to impress upon you all the need for total secrecy. Bad Cookie removed a crumpled post-it from his pocket, unfolding it. Earlier today, I discovered this handwritten note lying on the floor in the hallway. The careless message reads, Buy dental floss at Walgreens, fill up Kia at Costco, and assist an evil cabal in their quest to destroy civilization. Let this missive serve as an example of mindless behavior that I will not tolerate. Also, let it serve as a reminder that Costco has 87 octane for only 350 a gallon, if you are interested. Moving on. I wish to inform you that given the nature of our lab work, it is essential that we maintain a sterile environment. To that end, I have developed a stringent protocol regarding personal hygiene. Starting now, everyone will be required to change their socks and underwear every hour on the hour. To ensure that you are adhering to this order, you will be required to wear those pieces of apparel on the outside so we can check. And now... It is time to officially reveal that which future generations will speak of in whispers, shouts, and schoolgirl giggles. I present to you, secret prototype of aquatic weaponry, or as we will refer to it, SPA. A female attendee raised her hand, interrupting Bad Cookie, drawing his ire. Yes, you there with the ape-like face. Please ask your question quickly. That is, if you can form your words intelligibly through your comically large horse teeth. Okay, so I was just wondering... The scientist lisped. Wouldn't it be cooler if we changed the name of the project to the secret prototype of aquatic terror? That would be easier to remember, and it makes it sound nasty. No, that would be... Hey, wait. Another scientist interjected. Secretariat is on to something. How about secret prototype of aquatic mayhem? Or spam? That's got some zinc to it. Besides, who doesn't like spam? I tell you, some people are savages. Savages, I tell you. Enough! Bad Cookie yelled. The name is what it is and cannot nor will not be changed. That makes sense, whispered one scientist to his colleague. Probably already has the merch made up. P. 
People, people, it is time we get down to business, said Bad Cookie. Please turn your attention to the large screen behind me. The screen was blank, leaving Bad Cookie angry and bewildered. Where is the bloody information? He shouted. Doctor, I think the problem is you have it on HDMI 1. Maybe you should try HDMI 2. Someone suggested. No, no. That'll take you to Netflix. Posited another member. Try HDMI 3. What about PC? Offered another participant. I assume the presentation is on your laptop. Gee, I don't know about that, Lou, said the man next to him. I did a PowerPoint presentation once in a pop porn hub. Jesus, what a hullabaloo. Like I'm the only human being who likes watching one-eyed pygmies getting down with the Shetland pony they describe as their stepsister. A voice boomed from the back of the hall. Let me help you out there, Doc. Cleavon joined Bag Cookie at the front of the hall. This always works on my TV. He spit on the laptop and pounded it with his fist. What, you stupid piece of crap? The title of Bad Cookie's presentation, Spa, filled the screen. Everyone woo-hooed in amazement at Cleavon's unexpected critical thinking skills. Bad Cookie was relieved and impressed. Why, thank you, Cleavon. And to think I considered you a monosyllabic vacuous cretin. Unable to understand the slight, Cleavon smiled proudly, flashing his gleaming front tooth. Thank you, dog. Glad to help. Glad to help. Well, guess I'll get on with cleaning out the chili bowl in the restrooms. Once Cleavon left the chamber, Bad Cookie continued with his presentation. Very well, Bad Cookie said. Let us begin. He advanced to the next frame. As you can see on this first slide, we have discovered and isolated a bacterium that has displayed the uncanny ability to attach itself to healthy cells and modify them. He clicked to the next piece of video footage that was taken from the point of view of a microscope. What you see here is a group of cells that were extracted from a healthy rhesus monkey who wishes to remain anonymous in order to protect his privacy. Now then, watch carefully. The video showed the aggressive bacterium smothering the monkey's cells. As you can see, Bad Cookie said, the healthy cells transformed and distorted into a variation that we call a B-cell absorption model. Simply put, we've developed an organism that can devour others and replicate into a different version of itself. The following images were more unsettling. Soon we tested the process on a living subject, Bad Cookie explained. We placed a small drop of the absorption model within proximity of this lab rat. I warn you, the images you are about to witness will be disturbing. Please maintain control of your bodily functions. The unsuspecting lab rat approached the red droplet, sniffing it. All at once, the droplet expanded, hurtling itself at the rat, rapidly encompassing it. The red slimy rat thing flopped around deliriously before falling on its side. A few seconds passed, then the rat-shaped creature became a glob of pulsing mucus. It flung itself against the wall of the glass enclosure, then oozed slowly downward, leaving a sticky trail of slime. And then, said Bad Cookie, moving on to the next video, Hands in latex gloves dropped a globulous rat subject into an enclosure with another rat. This time, gooey tentacles sprang from the grotesque creature, invading every orifice of the test subject, absorbing it, then expanding into a semi-round gelatinous mass. The screen went blank. The room was deathly silent. The situation fascinated and exhilarated some scientists in attendance while horrifying others. The scientist's reactions did not escape Bad Cookie's attention. 
He enjoyed both equally. I realize this is a lot to absorb, no pun intended. However, you must grasp the ultimate destination of all this. This strain can be unleashed in any environment, and within a short period of time, overtake everyone within. But before that part of the application can take place, we have to design a counterorganism that can neutralize the primary weapon. This is where you all come into play. As stated, our first goal is to mass-produce the B-cell absorption model. The blue team will handle this assignment. I will charge the red team with developing an antidote. We will direct each of you to one of the two teams. Are there any questions? Someone raised their hand. Yes, doctor, said Bad Cookie. And what is our time frame? Bad Cookie's demeanor became more ominous. Your time frame was hours ago. What do you mean? asked another scientist. The creature that you witnessed has escaped our lab, said Bad Cookie. We never could have imagined it would be this sophisticated. It can plan and execute. We only know that it escaped from its enclosure and made its way into the facility's water system before reaching open water. If this creature were to attack civilians, the world press would sensationalize our project and its unintended consequences, causing us to be shut down faster than a brothel in the Bible Belt. Soon, our adversaries will learn of this new biological weapon and use it as a precursor to war. And if any of our research data were to fall into their hands, as it most certainly would, then those adversaries will counter with a creation of their own. Now you can better understand our need for secrecy and speed. So far, we haven't heard about any incidents involving our subject, but that may change sooner than later. And with that, my distinguished colleagues, I believe it is time to wrap things up and get to work. Thank you again for agreeing to take part in SPA. You may all report to your assigned stations at this time. As Bad Cookie watched his subordinates file from the cavernous room, he grinned wickedly and thought, I wonder if I have time to catch an episode of the Law and Order Bingeathon. Chapter 6 About the same time that Lorna was considering mass homicide, Craig was well on his way home. As he drove down Georgia's Highway 21, the long stretch made famous by the Almond Brothers Band, he sang along to a tune that his father had cherished and taught him many years prior. Oh, girls, they wanna have fun. Oh, girls, just wanna have fun. Craig's phone cut his musical merriment short by playing Lorna's signature song, The Bitch is Back. He answered. Hey, sugar pie. What's up? I'm heading home early. Are you still at work? Yeah, about that. Gandhi on a tricycle. Did you lose another job? Now, darling, it ain't entirely my fault. I wasn't expecting osteoporosis to screw up my plan. Great. Now we're going to get sued by the attorneys at Slip, Trip, and Fall. As if we don't got enough problems. Sometimes you're as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Lorna's criticism was so heavy on Craig that he slumped in his seat. She'd beaten his self-worth so bad over time that if it weren't human, it'd be black-eyed and pissing blood. I'm starting to get tired of the things you say to me. It wouldn't hurt for you to think about your words of anger more carefully. Like what, Craig? You tell me how I should react to your poor choices. Craig was unprepared to offer suggestions. Well, I... I... Tell you what, Craig, write down what you want me to say to you in times like this, and I'll act like a hooker and try to say it like I mean it. 
Craig pouted. I know, I know. I screwed up again. We can talk about it back at the trailer if you wanna. Lorna's frustration ebbed a bit. Craig had fingered the cat again, but it wasn't helpful to tear him down over it. She exhaled, guilty and embarrassed. I'm sorry. I've had another bad day down at the Snappy Snip. I shouldn't have taken it out on you. I'll see you when I get home. Maybe we can drown our sorrows in some beers. Lorna's sudden U-turn touched Craig. Sounds like both of us could use a little love and understanding. I'll see you at home. Bye, sugar. After saying bye, Lorna switched on the radio in search of something uplifting. Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Cindy Lauper blared from the cheap speakers. Thinking about Cindy's annoying skin med commercials made Lorna roll her eyes. Then, in a thick Brooklyn accent, she said, I wonder if she's still five years clear. Chapter 7 Crap, he's found his way home again. Lorna mumbled in irritation as she pulled in front of the trailer. She got out of her car, stomped up the short metal staircase, and threw open the front door. Inside, Craig was kicked back on the sofa. Based on previous experience, he'd never owned a recliner again. He was sipping a Coors Light and watching television. What you watching? Lorna asked him. Oh, it's some commercial for a new doctor prescribed medication called All Licka. Lord, they got Calypta, Genuvia, Keytruda. How come they name all these new medications after black chicks you knew in high school? Would it kill them to name a pill for bipolar disorder Debian or Susanol? American pharmaceutical companies are trying to come out with as much medicine as they can so they can stay one step ahead of the Chinese government, Lorna opined. Frankly, I don't know what all the concern is about Chinese technology, for crying out loud. It's been over 2,000 years and they still haven't mastered silverware. I am not impressed. Seriously, added Craig. Here in the good old U.S. of A., we got the George Foreman Lean Mean Grilling Machine, the recipe for Sloppy Joes, and cans of Coors Light that have the mountains that turn taupe to let you know when your beer is cold enough to drink. World supremacy, baby. That's what I'm talking about. A to the men, Morna said as she snagged her own Coors Light from the fridge. She popped the top, took a healthy swig, and let go a roof-rumbling belch. Then she went to the sofa and plopped down next to Craig. You know, I've been thinking about something. We both been stressed out lately. What if we was to get away for a while, like a vacation? Craig took a deep pull off his beer and thought about the idea. Hmm, that one has potential. Elaborate. Well, how's about a trip to the coast? We can go online and look for a motel or a small rental house we can afford. What do you think? Craig considered the pitch. Where'd you have in mind? I could call my sister Clovis down in Savannah and see if she has any recommendations. That might work. But who's going to watch El Superbo while we're gone? If we go with the rental house, we can look for one that takes pets. Craig leaned up a bit and looked at El Superbo sleeping in his dog bed. What'd you think about that, boy? Want to chase the surf? El Superbo belched, uh. then farted loudly. <laughs> I'll take that as a... Sure, why not? Alrighty then. I'll call her tonight. I haven't spoken with her in ages. It'll be nice to catch up. Well, count me on board, Craig said. He looked at his can of Coors, sullen. Say, what's it mean when the mountains turn brown? Chapter 8 The Moon, the Surf the making of memories of the time when you were young enough to be fearless but old enough to understand boundaries. The small group of college kids had the sea to themselves. Night swimming was a time for youthful recklessness. A time for cold beer, salty kisses in the sand, and promises that they'd stay in touch after graduation. Excuse me, guys, Katie said. I'm going to grab another beer. Would you grab me one, too? asked her boyfriend, Lance. Sure, babe. I'd do anything for you, she said with a fake Valley Girl accent. Katie swam the short distance to the shore and headed for the cooler. Once there, she fished through the ice until she came across the blue moons that she and Lance had contributed. She turned and took a step before stopping. 
She stared in confusion at the empty water. Guys? Hey, guys? Worried, Katie jogged to the water's edge, her hands squeezing the bottles of icy beers. This isn't funny, you jerks. She waited for the first of the group to breach the surface and laugh at her dumbfounded expression. She waited some more. You've got to come up for air sometime. Katie became anxious. Seriously, guys, this isn't funny anymore. She set the beers down, walked a few feet out into the water, and waited another minute or two. Oh, God. She muttered to herself. I'm calling 911. This is just... Katie's legs flew out from under her. The beach was empty again. Chapter 9 The loud crackling of the overhead speaker startled everyone in the labs. Feedback squealed briefly before a chilling and familiar voice appeared. I trust everyone is diligently working to achieve the goals that were set for your respective groups. It is vital that you remain steadfast in this pursuit. I planned a training session for you exploring ways in which you can do just that. However, someone moved the session that was scheduled for later today to tomorrow, and then rescheduled it again for yesterday. So unfortunately, you've missed it. Still... I'm counting on you all to produce results in a timely manner. Failure to do so will result in your family being kidnapped, tortured, then executed. We will then resuscitate them, give them a sandwich and a Gatorade to replenish their strength, after which we will torture and execute them again. On an impressive third go-round, we will resuscitate them, Get them another sandwich with Gatorade. Subject them to a different torture method just to keep things fresh and interesting. Then execute them a final time. One scientist found the courage to challenge Bad Cookie. How dare you, sir? Harming our loved ones will not bring about a solution. Your threats have little meaning to me. You're right, Doctor. We should increase the severity of the punishment. Anyone who fails to deliver a suitable product in a timely manner will cause their family to be kidnapped, after which we will force them to fold fitted sheets. No! You're a monster! A scientist declared. Shut up, Tim. I beg you, Dr. Bad Cookie. Don't force my family to suffer such a gruesome fate. They could be at it for hours, days even. They'll go mad. We promise to do as you say, right, everyone? A chorus of enthusiastic yeses circulated through the lab. Glad to hear it. I trust I've made my point. You may resume your duties. Bad Cookie switched off the PA system, leaned back in his chair, and relaxed. A knock on his office door interrupted his respite. What is it? He yelled at the perpetrator. I have some urgent information you need to hear, came the reply. Very well. Come in. The door opened, and a menacing man in a black paramilitary uniform marched in, closing the door behind him. He was tall and fit, a no-nonsense type with dead black eyes. A long scar crisscrossed his forehead, making him look like Frankenstein's monster. Above his rugged face was a severe gray speckled crew cut that lay flat as a board. On his hip was a holstered forty-five caliber Desert Eagle, a veritable hand cannon. He drummed its black rubber grip with his index finger. I hope this is important, Colonel Sturdy. It is, sir. As you ordered, we've been monitoring all emergency response scanners for any activity that might involve the project. And? Yesterday morning, someone reported a man missing after he went metal detecting the previous night. They found his hat in the detector on the beach, but no signs of him. Also, about ten minutes ago, a local college reported some kids missing. 
Their friend said they'd gone to the beach to hang out. Maybe we should investigate to determine if the disappearances are connected to our problem. An unfamiliar look of concern was on Bad Cookie's typically stoic face. Yes, get on it right away. But be careful in conducting your inquiries. This facility does not exist. Understand? Understood, sir. Sturdy saluted, then turned and left the office. Bad Cookie had figured something like this might happen, had planned for it well in advance, hence the security measures. He leaned back in his chair again and relaxed. And so it begins. Chapter 10 Hello? Clovis said, answering her phone. Hey, big sis. Lorna said on the other end. Have I caught you at a bad time? A pause. Well, I am in the middle of something, but I got it under control. So why is my baby sister calling out of the blue? I ain't heard from you since last Easter. Nobody's died, have they? A wondrous thought sprang to Clovis's mind. Ooh, ooh! She grunted in joy. Did Craig die? Did you finally take my advice and kill him? Maybe we shouldn't be talking on an open line. I can roll into town late tomorrow night. We can figure out a place to move the body. I heard that there's an abandoned... No, Clovis, he ain't dead. However, I was calling to ask you about some beach rentals down there on the coast of Savannah. Maybe at Tybee Island? Me and Craig need a break, so we thought we'd go bury our head in the sand for a bit. Hmm, I think... Clovis, let me out of here. You'll never get away with this. Called a voice in the background. Lorna thought she recognized the voice. Clovis, what was that? It sounded like Earl. What Craig was to Lorna, Earl was to Clovis. The bloom of romance had fallen off the flower a while back and had plummeted several stories down into a bustling street, killing an innocent bystander. Clovis considered herself the bystander. No, no. Clovis assured her. Uh, Earl left. I ain't seen him in a while. When did this... Clovis, I'm hungry, and it's dark down here. The unknown voice begged. Shut up! Clovis yelled. Lorna was concerned. Clovis, are you sure Earl's gone? That sure did sound an awful lot like him. Funny thing, she said. My neighbor's got this cat whose meow sound just like a person tied to a chair in a settler. Lorna was aware of the marital strife that existed between her sister and brother-in-law. She also knew that Clovis had two troubling traits. She loved watching true crime shows and was a creative and violent problem solver. Well, all right, if you say so, Lorna said, though her gut told her that the tarp and lime were likely to come into play in Earl's immediate future. Clovis pivoted back to the original discussion. As far as rental properties, there's three ways you can go. You can book a week at an Airbnb down around the Isle of Hope, but you'll need a couple of grand. If that's a little rich for you, you might can find something a little cheaper on the outskirts of Tybee Island. For them, you'll need a thousand or so. Or, if you're on a tiny budget, you could check out some of the beachfront houses. If you go that route, you'll need to be up to date on your tetanus shot. Help! Somebody let me out of here! The same unknown voice shouted from the distance. Clovis, Lorna said. Are you sure that ain't Earl yelling for help? Clovis laughed nervously. <laughs> Look, we had a little falling out over him blowing half his paycheck again getting drunk with his buddies. But we came to an agreement, so everything's okie dokie. Well, I... Hey! There's a rat looking at me! The voice said with alarm. Then... Here, boy. Come on, these ropes. They's mighty tasty. Hold on a sec, Lorna. Clovis said. I need to go take care of that pesky cat. Over the phone, Lorna heard footsteps thundering across the room. A door banged open. Then the footsteps diminished as if they were stomping down a flight of stairs. The pitiful voice followed. Thank goodness, you finally come to you. Hey, what are you going to do with that lamp? Lorna heard a faint crash, followed by the return of heavy footsteps clomping up the stairs and across the room to where the phone was. Sorry. That cat was being such a nuisance. Anyways, there's a few real estate offices you can go online and look at. 
You're bound to find something that suits you. Thanks, sis. We'll do that, Lorna said. Hey, maybe we can stop by for a quick visit when we get into town. Another pause. Yeah, about that, Clovis said. I'm going to be out of town for a bit. I'll need to lie low. I mean, I'll see you before you go. Yeah, that's what I meant. It ain't like Earl and me's been arguing a lot lately. He stopped dragging in late, reeking of stripper sweat, and buying guns and motorcycles without consulting with me first. Lorna had her doubts. Just give me a holler if you want to get together sometime. Oh, you bet your girlfriend. Give my best to Craig. Maybe after you get back, he can spend some time with Earl. That's very doable. That's okay. Craig stays pretty... Very doable. Lorna struggled to get off the line. Okay, love you. Very doable. Okay, bye, sis. Lorna said, bringing the confab to an immediate halt. Lorna! Craig yelled from the living room. I think El Superbo ate the remote control. Every time he poots, the channel changes. Lorna slumped. Very doable, she muttered, grinning. Chapter 11 Later that night, Craig and Lorna hunkered together on the sofa and shopped around for some affordable accommodations. Finally, they hit upon an agency that fell more in line with their meager budget. Click on the one called Lowered Expectations Beach Rentals, Craig instructed Lorna. Upon accessing the agency's website, Lorna immediately felt underwhelmed. There were only a dozen available units, all of them only slightly less luxurious than a restroom at a convention for irritable bowel syndrome. Like most beach rentals, each house had a catchy moniker. The Captain's Crotch, The Mouthy Winch, Catching Crabs, and other titles that God-fearing parents would tell their children never to repeat. What's this one at the bottom? asked Craig, pointing to a black and white picture of a cinder block house. Lorna clicked on the image and recited the info to Craig. Come join us for a week of sandy pleasure at our most popular stay, Hepatitis Seaside. A leisurely ride on two buses and a rickshaw will land you on the very shores that have been visited by famous figures from the past and present, such as the pirate's black beard and loose neck skin, the third extra from the ride in the mashed potato scene in Animal House, and the former personal assistant to Carrot Top. This wonderful home is conveniently located near a Piggly Wiggly that accepts food stamps. We offer a luxury package that includes one free visit from Clayboy's Pest Control, a vintage refrigerator, electricity may not apply, and complimentary snacks left behind by previous tenants. Contact our rental office today to book your once-in-a-lunchtime adventure. Lorna had her doubts about the rental agency. I don't know if I trust an agency that misspells a word like adventure. How'd they spell it? A-D-V-E-N-C-H-U-R-E? Idiots. <laughs> they left out the queue. You want me to book it? At 500 a week, it's the cheapest one they got. Says here at the bottom that it'll be released from crime scene status by the end of the week. I guess it's any port in a storm. Yeah, go ahead and book it. Lorna made the arrangements. Then they ate a couple of Hot Pockets and went to bed. As they slept, each swirled in a world of dreams filled with white sand and enchanted coconut trees, blissfully ignorant of what awaited them at Tybee Beach. They were about to encounter something more sinister than empty beer cans, discarded blunts, and sand fleas. Something far more sinister. Chapter 12 Barney, Frank, and Todd had been looking forward to this sea outing for a while. Their small law firm had been clawing its way through a civil lawsuit for months. They had filed the briefs and set the court date. Now they were making the most of the downtime before the case was heard. Someone rumored the deep water fishing near Tybee Beach to be excellent, so they chartered a boat and put out to sea. They sipped Coronas, smoked pricey cigars, and shared stories of their college glory days. The bright June sun glittered on the water, making it come alive with dancing light that punished the eyes of those who watched it for too long. The air smelled of salt and sweet cigar smoke. A symphony of laughter, clinking bottles, and water slapping against the sides of the boat carried over the ocean. 
Soon, the sound of Frank's real whirring drew their attention. Whoa, Frankie, Todd said. I do believe you got one. Astute as ever, Frankie said. He leaned forward in his seat and braced his feet against the short aft wall. With maximum effort, he utilized his underused lawyer arms to pull, release, and crank the reel forward. Come on, you've got this! Barney yelled. Tell that to my back, Frank answered. His drunk friends cheered him on. Frankie, the end Frankie, of Frank's fishing rod Frankie, bent to within Frankie, an inch of snapping. Frankie, Feeling the prey Frankie, moving rapidly Frankie, toward the surface, Frankie, he threw his Frankie, body weight back Frankie, as far as possible. Frankie. The red, round object launched itself through the warm sea air, unfolding like a blanket and covering Frank. Holy crap! yelled Barney. What is that? Todd took action. Don't just stand there. Help me get this thing off him. Barney didn't respond. Fear encased him. Todd screamed as soon as he took hold of an edge of the pulsing mass. His hands felt like he had grabbed a white hot sheet of metal. He stared in shock as the goop spread over his hands and arms, slithering its way towards his shoulders. Hey, Barney! Oh God, it burns! Barney! Barney remained frozen, too horrified to act. In helpless horror, Barney watched the glob slide onto Todd's shoulders with the tendril penetrating one ear and exiting the other, causing his eyes to move in different directions. His nostrils bulged as branches of the tendril slipped from his nose, then crawled in through his open mouth. Barney screamed like a lunatic being dragged to hell. Ah! Breaking free of his trance, he bolted up the short flight of steps that led to the boat's small wheelhouse. He snatched a shortwave radio mic. Mayday! Mayday! I need help now! I repeat! I Barney stopped at the sound of creaking behind him. His body fell limp, causing him to drop the mic. His legs felt like wet chewing gum. His mouth dry as salt. Sensing someone directly behind him, he turned, his heart thumping. The two man-globs hugged him as if he was still a friend. But as Barney soon understood, hugs from friends don't make you boil. Chapter 13 It was after 4 p.m. the following Saturday when Craig and Lorna arrived at their destination. They had loaded the back of the truck with all the essentials they had purchased at the middle-class vacationer's mecca, Sam's Club. Two large cardboard boxes of Texas-sized cinnamon buns? Check. A big tub of barbecue pork rinds? Double check. And least but last, two cases of the cheapest beer they could find. Dingle Daddies. Add in their two suitcases, a large box of essentials, and a rusty set of lawn chairs they brought from home, and they were ready to kickstart the party. Well, it ain't quite as bad as I expected. Lorna said, sizing up the house. Yeah, I reckon it'll do, Craig said. All right, then. Let's go in and see what we've gotten ourselves into. You stay here, El Superbo. Craig and Lorna exited the truck and headed across the small yard, playing a brisk game of dodge the animal feces on the way to the front door. Lorna's face scrunched. That's nasty. Somebody needs to do something about that. Craig offered a worthy solution. Call El Superbo. He'll eat them suckers like sausages. Lorna turned to the truck. Here, boy. Soup's on. El Superbo jumped from the truck cab and began hoovering the dried white debris. You got the key that they mailed us? Lorna asked. Craig fished through the pockets of his short Hawaiian pants and retrieved the house key. Yep, got it right here. They tore through the yellow X of the police tape covering the front door unlocked it and went inside. The pungent aroma of toe jam and dung-filled diapers greeted them as they entered. They proceeded to the living room and saw a tape outline of a person with twisted legs and a severed head wearing a party hat. A short distance away, they noticed an outline of a unicorn with an axe buried in its skull. And beyond that, the outline of a chihuahua clutching what resembled a Mac-10 machine gun. Craig's mouth was ajar at the sight. What in the world do you think? I don't want to know, finished Lorna. 
They checked out the rest of the house for more surprises, but found none, save for the overall uncleanliness of the place. You know, I feel incredibly proud of the housekeeper who was supposed to have cleaned the place before our arrival. I'm confident she won some type of award for cleaning an entire 1,200-square-foot beach house in less than two minutes. Know what you mean, Craig said. I'm feeling a deep sense of gratitude for the kindness displayed by the toddler who left us her half-eaten PBJ and a cup of milk under the bed in the master bedroom. From what I saw, so do the ants and cockroaches. Honestly, right now I'd rather be at a dump on the beach than anywhere close to the snappy snip, Lorna said. Let's go empty the truck and get settled in. I want to hit the beach before it gets dark. No telling what kind of nonsense goes on in this town at night. After unloading and storing the booty all over the dining room floor, Craig and Lorna proceeded to make the bed and unpack their clothing. By the time they had gotten settled in and eaten something, it was closing in on six o'clock. Crap, Lorna huffed. I wanted to be on the beach by now. Well, let's throw on our bathing suits and hit it, Craig said. I'll clean up while you get ready, then I'll follow suit. Now you're speaking the language, Lorna chirped. By the time Craig had thrown away the trash and wiped down the kitchen table, Lorna had finished dressing. She strutted into the tiny kitchen and showed off her new one-piece swimsuit to Craig. Ta-da! What you think? She asked, smiling. Craig attempted to hide his repulsion at seeing 200 pounds of bowberry biscuit squeezed into an outfit meant for 100 pounds of stunning beauty. He planned to choose his words carefully. However, like all his other plans, this one was also doomed to failure. That looks like one sturdy piece of fabric, he managed. Lorna's eyes narrowed and her lips pouted. What's that supposed to mean? Are you saying this bathing suit makes me look fat? Craig realized that he had committed the mental equivalent of stepping around a wad of gum only to stomp on a hot pile of dog dew instead. Now a smart man would scrape the mess off his shoe and soldier on, but Craig was not a smart man. He was not only too stupid to clean off the crap, he was going to drag it into the house as well. No, darling, Craig said. I don't think the bathing suit makes you look fat. It's right pretty. It's your fat that makes you look fat. White dots danced in front of Craig's eyes as he felt his chin give way under Lorna's powerful punch. To him, it felt like he was floating like a feather when, in reality, his body was dropping to the floor like an anvil. His skull bounced twice off the pink linoleum, sending him to a warm, magical place where pain is absent. And so, too, are pissed-off women. Lorna's satisfaction was short-lived. Craig was out for the count. She grew concerned. Craig, are you alive? When he didn't respond, she kicked him. Come on now, it weren't that bad. When he remained unresponsive, Lorna worried. She knelt beside him and felt for a pulse. A greasy ball of dread churned in her stomach when she couldn't detect one. Very doable. Clovis's cryptic words circled Lorna's mind like hungry buzzards. Lorna's love for Craig, an existence she would deny in open court, was stronger than her anger toward him. CPR, do CPR she told herself. She had never administered CPR before, but she had seen it performed on TV numerous times. I got this. Just breathe in his mouth and press on his chest, she thought. Lorna tilted Craig's head back, then pressed her mouth to his. She retched. Buddha in a brothel. Did the dog share the leftover poop with you? I can't do this. There's got to be a better way. Lorna remembered another form of CPR shock paddles. She sprinted to the living room, grabbed the mermaid lamp, and returned to the crime scene. Once there, she removed the lampshade and light bulb and plugged the cord into a wall socket. She removed Craig's sneaker and sock, then grabbed the jar of peanut butter from the counter. She opened it, scooped out a blob with her index finger, and slathered it on Craig's big toe. El Superbo, here boy, Lorna called. Mama's got a special treat. El Superbo trotted into the kitchen and went to Craig. He sniffed the peanut butter on Craig's toe, then began licking it with unbridled enthusiasm. 
When Craig's toe was amply wet, Lorna pushed El Superbo aside. Clear! She hollered, jamming Craig's toe into the open socket. To her confusion and dismay, nothing happened. Clear! Lorna screamed again. She jammed his toe into the socket. No response. Why ain't this working? She muttered in desperation. It was then Lorna noticed that in her haste to revive Craig, she accidentally unplugged the lamp. Thank God, this still might work. Lorna set the lamp down, crawled the short distance to the wall socket, and plugged it in. Fresh out of peanut butter, El Superbo began licking Craig's face. Lorna was so frantic that she didn't notice the dog connecting himself to Craig with his wet tongue. Without bothering with the clear command, she crammed Craig's toe back into the electrified socket. In an instant, an arc of white electricity shot from Craig's open mouth and through El Superbo's body, exiting through his rectum. The streak of lightning struck Lorna in her head, turning her hair into a blonde smoking afro. In an instant, an explosive bolt shot from her body, blasting her skyward until her head smacked into the ceiling, penetrating it. Lorna looked like a large, cheap pinata as she swung back and forth from the hole in the ceiling. She screamed and thrashed, kicking everything off the counter with her flailing feet. Craig bolted to a sitting position, breaking his connection to El Superbo. He blinked mindlessly, taking in his surroundings. He saw Lorna's headless body twisting as it hung from the ceiling. Attempting to dislodge herself, Lorna pressed against the ceiling with her chubby peanut-buttered hands to no avail. Help me! Help me! She yelled from the attic. Craig got to his feet. Feeling unsteady, he leaned on the counter. He heard a zapping noise and looked in its direction. El Superbo was lying on his side, licking his privates. Each time his tongue made contact, his body jerked. Then he resumed licking. Well now, that's dedication, Craig mumbled. Lorna's incessant screeching drew Craig's attention back to her. Baby, what you doing up there? And where's your head at? The screaming stopped. Craig, that's you? That's your service? What happened to me? I feel all tingly inside. I'll explain that later. First, help me get my head unstuck. Craig staggered to Lorna, losing his balance again. He grabbed onto Lorna's legs to steady himself, pulling a strain on her neck. Ow! Let go of my legs, you half-wit. You keep stretching my neck and I'm going to end up looking like a chubby giraffe. Look, just crawl between my legs and let me sit on your shoulders. Then maybe I can pull my head loose without ripping it completely off. Okie doke, here we go. He guided himself under Lorna and let her weight rest on his shoulders. Now listen, Lorna explained. I'm going to push on the ceiling whilst you gently pull downward. Let's do this nice and slow. Now start pulling. As Lorna strained against the ceiling, Craig took a few steps backward. The floor was littered with the items that Lorna had kicked off the counter. Craig's feet discovered some of them, causing him to trip. The downward force plucked Lorna's head from its sheetrock prison like an overgrown rutabaga. Lorna squealed, grabbing Craig's head, covering his eyes. Together, they bounced off the walls and counters like pinballs. El Superbo, thinking they were playing, joined them. He stood on his hind legs and drove his massive paws into Craig's chest, sending him backwards out of the kitchen and into the living room. What in hell's going on? Craig yelled. Put me down, you dang fool, Lorna replied. I'm trying to, woman, but you got my eyes covered up. I don't know where to drop you. Craig and Lorna spun around the living room, knocking pictures off walls and smashing small furniture. Lorna's head violently collided with the spinning ceiling fan, almost scalping her. El Superbo, who thought the game was still going on, mounted Craig and began humping his leg. The threesome made quite the wrecking crew as they tore their way through the house, yelling, destroying, and humping. They eventually crashed through a sliding glass door leading to a deck. <laughs> Lorna screamed in horror as Craig stumbled closer to the stairs. Craig, stop! Make the dog stop first! He's riding my leg so hard it's gonna have to join a victim support group! It was suddenly too late. 
Craig stepped off the deck and into the empty air. The threesome tumbled over each other as they bounced to the bottom of the staircase. The calamity in motion continued as they rolled across a small patch of gravel and into two metal garbage cans like a trio of bowling balls. Craig sat up on his elbows, shaking some sense back into his aching noggin. <laughs> Lorna girl, you all right? Lorna rose and removed the trash can from her upper body. Yeah, I'm okay. She picked coffee grounds and banana peels out of her tumbleweed hair, then took notice of her damaged swimsuit. Dang it, I really like this bathing suit. For reasons known only to himself, Craig thought now would be an appropriate time to double down on his earlier comment. Like I told you, darling, that thing is sturdy. The clang of the metal trash can lid colliding with Craig's pre-damaged head startled El Superbo, who bolted in terror. Ow! What'd you have to do that for? Don't worry. That's one sturdy skull you got there. Indeed he does. And that was part one of Craig's Sea Terror by P.D. Williams. To be continued. I know, I don't like splitting stories up either. But rules is rules and we all gotta follow them, friends. Even though Drew Blood. Sometimes. A little about the author. P.D. Williams is a complex man. To know him is to love him. To not know him is to love him from afar. He likes pina coladas and getting caught in the rain, so he lives as a homeless person behind the bar in Tijuana. His 2023 collection of short horror fiction, Dark House Many Rooms, is available on Amazon, Audible, and wherever else you get your audiobooks. For those of you who have been enjoying the latest Craig and Lorna adventure, here's some great news. PD has just released a book bundle called Straight Outta Claxton, the Craig and Lorna series, books one through three. You can snag a copy at the outlets mentioned earlier, as well as from Ernesto, the guy who sells oranges in the Walmart parking lot in Port Fart, and that's in Mississippi. If you'd like to receive discount codes for both or other books, reach out to PD through his website, pdwilliamsauthor.com, or at Facebook, PD Williams Horror Writer. However, if you elect not to buy a copy of his books, Satan himself will seat you in hell next to Hitler, Stalin, and bass players who use picks. Thanks, PD. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 Bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So, you know what? Just crash on the couch, will you? Part twos always take a bit of a dive, and I'm not going to risk it this time. So drink all you want and I'll shackle you to the floor when you're passed out. Don't take it personal. I want to remind you all that old Drew Blood has his own personal Patreon account. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Drew Blood to find it and join up. 
There hasn't been a lot going on here lately, but we're about to change that. Anyway, may the wind be at your back, eventually, and may the road rise up to meet you, later. You're not going anywhere, friend. <laughs> so, this week, no fucking yourselves. That's odd to say. Good night, friends. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.